Hello everyone and welcome to this Druid Mechanics tutorial. I'm going to show you how to get some basic bow and arrow functionality. So I have this character who has a bow and arrow and I can launch arrows. I have crosshairs so I can aim the arrows and they fly in the correct direction. And they stick into whatever they hit and play a particle system. And we also have gravity on these arrows as they're using a projectile movement component. So they will have some fall off, but we can adjust that as we'll see. We can have zero gravity if we like. So in this lecture, we are going to get this basic movement and arrow functionality set up. So let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing we're gonna do is create a new project. So I'm gonna launch Unreal Engine 5 and we're going to select games and third person. So we're going to use the third person template. This is going to be a blueprint project. We're going to focus on the concepts behind getting bow and arrow functionality working. So I'm going to go ahead and stick this in a folder that I would like. I'm going to put it right here and call this project Archer. So let's go ahead and create this third person template project. So we have our third person template project and we have the mannequin and it has basic movement, jumping and all of that good stuff. And we're gonna use that. So we don't have to focus on the basics of character creation. We don't really need to go into that. The focus of this video is for bow and arrow functionality. So what I'd like to do is use this character, except we're going to get our own assets for this project. So for that, we're gonna to go to the marketplace. And on the marketplace, there's a great bow and arrow pack. It's in the Paragon assets. So if we search for Paragon, we can find Sparrow. And Sparrow has several different skins. They look great. And there are tons of bow and arrow animations. She also has her own bow and arrow, so this is perfect. So we're gonna add this to our project and I'm gonna search for Archer and choose the brand new Archer project that I just created and click add to project. And once that's finished, we have just about everything we need. Now this doesn't come with crosshairs. So what you're gonna do is go to my GitHub repository for my multiplayer shooter course. So I'll have a link in the description below and you can go to this link and take this x underscore hair dot targa. So go ahead and download that. You're gonna click on it and you'll be taken to this page where you can hit download. And once you've downloaded it, you'll now have this crosshair. Now mine says parentheses one because I already had one. Yours will just say x underscore hair dot targa. So we're gonna import this into our project. So here in our project, I'd like to make a new folder in content and call this Archer. And here in Archer, I'm gonna make a new folder and call this textures. And we'll stick that crosshairs texture here. So let's click import and I'm gonna get that xhair.targa. And right away, let's open it up. And right here in compression settings, we're gonna change this to user interface 2D. So the compression settings are configured so we can use this as a UI element. So we can close that and we have our textures here. Now I have Paragon Sparrow and in characters, heroes, Sparrow, meshes, we can double click Sparrow and here's the skeletal mesh for Sparrow and it looks quite awesome and there are different skins for it as we'll see. So I'm gonna go ahead and go into my content folder and in the content folder, we have third person blueprints and here's a BP third person character. This is the character blueprint for the third person template. And as we can see, it has movement already set up. And if we click the viewport, here's the mannequin. We're gonna replace that with the Paragon character. So let's click mesh and right here for the skeletal mesh, we're gonna find Sparrow. Now, there are different versions of Sparrow. For example, Sparrow Monarch. Here's what the Sparrow Monarch skin looks like. So pick the skin that you like best. I like this Autumn Fire, so I'm gonna go with this one. Now, as soon as we changed it, our Anim class is set to none because we don't have an animation blueprint. 
So if we go back into our editor and press play, we'll see that we don't have any movement animation. So we're gonna have to set that up. So here in our Archer folder, let's make a new folder here and we'll call this blueprints. And we're gonna make an animation blueprint. So right click animation and animation blueprint and we'll select the Sparrow Skeleton. So click Create. And we'll rename this to ABP underscore Archer. So this is pretty empty and we're gonna need a state machine. So let's right click, type state machine and get a new state machine and call this ground locomotion. And this will be our basic ground locomotion. So we can hook that straight in and open it and we'll have a couple of states here. So we'll drag out, add a state, and I'll call this one idle and we'll drag off to do another state called run. So we'll have two states in here. And from run, we'll have a transition back to idle. Now idle is going to be simple and there are lots of animations. Go ahead and go through all the animations and see all the different stuff that's here. For the idle, we're gonna use idle front end. And this is what it looks like. So she's just standing there holding the bow and arrow. So we're gonna stick that right there into the result. And for run, we're gonna need a blend space as we want strafing. So let's go ahead and make one for this. So right click, go to animation and blend space 1D. We're just gonna do a 1D blend space. Now I'm gonna choose Sparrow Skeleton for this and call this blend space running. So let's go ahead and open that. And the first thing we're gonna do is set our horizontal axis name to yaw offset. So we're gonna have running animations and the forward running animation will be in the middle, backward will be at the sides and we'll have left and right and we'll blend between those based on our offset between the running velocity and our aim velocity. And that'll allow us to strafe. So the minimum axis will be negative 180, the maximum will be positive 180, and that'll cover all the possible values for our yaw offset. So I'm gonna search for jog and stick a jog backward in here. By default, it doesn't snap to any of the lines in Unreal Engine 5. We're gonna have to hold shift to snap those. So we're gonna snap jog backward to the outer bounds and we'll put a jog forward in the middle and a jog left right there on the left and jog right to the right. Now if we hold control we can scrub through and see what she looks like and we'll see that she's running to the right when that yaw offset is 90 degrees and if it's negative 90 she runs to the left and as we approach negative or positive 180 she runs backward. So that's our basic running blend space. We're gonna save that and go back to our animation blueprint and use this in our run state here. So in run, we're gonna drag in running, hook that up, and we now need a yaw offset. So we're gonna need some variables here. And we can set these here in the event graph. So here in the event graph, we're going to want a couple of variables. I'd like to have the character and its movement component. So we're gonna use the event blueprint initialize animation and we'll use a get owning actor node to get the actor that owns this animation blueprint. Now I'm gonna take that and cast it to a BP third person character because that's the character we're using here. So we'll cast that and promote this to a variable. So I'm gonna to promote to a variable and call this character. And now we have a handle on the character. Now from the character, we're gonna want the character movement component. So we'll drag off and type character movement and we'll get character movement. And we'll go ahead and promote this to a variable as well and call this movement component. And that way we can get that movement component and access values such as the velocity and so on. Now below we already have a blueprint update animation which is like the tick function for animation blueprints. And what we're gonna do here is set some variables such as our velocity, whether or not we're falling and so on. So the first thing I'll do is take my character and drag it out and get a getter node for this and right click and convert it to a validated get. So we can use this to prevent us from trying to access the character if it's not set, kind of like checking a null pointer in C++. So if is valid, 
is executed, then we're safe to continue. And I'm going to do a few things here. So I'll add a sequence node, and that way we can keep things organized and do them one at a time. And the first thing I'm going to do is get the movement component here. And from the movement component, I'd like to get the velocity. So I'm going to type velocity and use get velocity here. And I'd like to store that in a variable on the animation blueprint. So I'm going to promote this to a variable and call this simply velocity. And so we'll go ahead and set that here as the first thing we do every single frame. And I'd also like to get the magnitude of this velocity, but I don't care about the Z component. I just want the X and Y. So I'm going to drag off of the velocity and type vector length and we can use vector length x, y. And this will give us the x, y velocity without the z component. So it's essentially zeroed out. And I'm going to promote this one to a variable and call this ground speed. So we have our ground speed, not taking our z velocity into account. So that's the first thing we're going to do here. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to set a Boolean for whether or not we should be moving as in running around. So we're going to add a new variable. This will be a Boolean and we're going to call this should move. So in order to see if we should move, we should check our acceleration on the movement component. So we're going to get our movement component. I'm going to control D to duplicate that one and drag off and get current acceleration. So we'll get the acceleration this frame and I'm going to take this return value and see if it's not equal to zero. And we'll see that we have this not equal node for vectors with a tolerance. And I'm going to leave that tolerance at zero. Now I'd also like to check my ground speed. So I'm going to get that ground speed variable as well. And make sure that this is not close to zero. So that way we don't get movement if we're moving very slowly. So I'm going to take this and make sure that it's greater than a very small value. And that small value is going to be something like three. So we'll take that. And if these are both true, then we should be moving. So I'm going to make an and Boolean here. So and bool. And we'll use this value to set should move. So we're going to get a setter for that and set the value of should move. And this is the second thing we're going to do with our sequence. So we'll drag that in and I'll go ahead and move these down and out of the way and add a reroute node here. So we've set a should move variable. Now the next thing I'm going to do is have another Boolean here called is falling. And this will be for our jump animations. So we'll add a third pin here. And this one will be simple. We'll take our movement component, control D to duplicate it and drag off of this and get is falling. And we'll use this to set is falling. So that's the third thing that we'll do in our sequence here every frame. So we'll add a reroute node there as well. Okay, so we've done three different things here. Now we did make a running blend space and we have a yaw offset. So we're gonna need a variable to determine whether we're strafing, running forward or running backward. So to do that, I'm gonna zoom in here. I'm gonna get my character and from the character, I'm gonna drag off and get base aim rotation. And this will give us a rotator based on which direction we're aiming in. And I'd like to go ahead and right click on this and promote it to a variable and call this one base aim rotation. So we'll store that one and I'll go ahead and add a pin for the fourth thing we're doing here in the sequence and add a reroute node. So we're getting our base aim rotation and storing that. Now I'd like to see the difference between this rotation and the rotation that represents the direction we're running in. So that means we need our velocity. So I'm going to drag the velocity out and drag off of this so I can get a rotator that represents our velocity direction. And to do that, we can simply use make rot from X, which basically takes our velocity's X axis and uses that to create a rotator as we only need one of the axes of our velocity to make a rotator. We're going to use the X as that's the forward direction of our rotator. Now I'm going to take the difference between this rotation and my base aim rotation, and that will give me my yaw offset. So to get a difference, I'm going to drag off and type Delta 
and get a delta rotator node and get the delta between my velocity's rotation and my base aim rotation. So the difference between these gives me the rotator that represents the delta between my velocity rotation and my aim rotation. That's what I want. So I'm gonna drag off of this and break this rotator because I'm really only interested in the yaw for this as the yaw is what's going to determine whether we should be strafing or running forward. So I'm gonna take this yaw and right click and promote this to a variable and call this yaw offset. So now I have my yaw offset that I can use in my blend space. And that's the fourth and final thing. So we can go ahead and comment these real quick. I'm gonna comment this one and say calculate ground speed and for the next thing we're going to comment this one and this will simply say should move question mark now the third one is going to be if we're falling so we'll comment this and say is falling question mark and finally we're getting our yaw offset in the fourth one so we'll comment this and say calculate yaw offset Okay, so we have some variables that we can use in our animation blueprint, and we're all set up. So we have our running blend space. We know our yaw offset. Let's go ahead and go back into our run state here where we added our running blend space, and we're gonna use yaw offset and plug that in for the axis value. Now we can go back out to ground locomotion, and we have idle and run. We just need to transition between these two. And this will be simple. We only want to run if should move is true. So we're going to go into this transition and use should move here to transition from idle to run. And from run back to idle, we're going to use should move with a not boolean. So if should move is false, then we'll go back to idle. All right, so we have ground locomotion, and basically it's just idle and running functionality. So we can compile and save that and go back to our third person character and select our mesh and choose our new ABP Archer animation blueprint. And we'll see that we have this idle animation. She suddenly looks a lot more formidable. And we can go ahead and press play, and we'll see that we're idling, and if we start running, we have running now we strafe only we're orienting our rotation to movement which is not what we want we want to use our controller rotation so i'm going to shift escape to get out of this and go back to my third person character and select self and search for use controller rotation yaw and make sure to check that so we want to use our controller rotation yaw and i'm going to get my character movement component and search for orient rotation to movement and uncheck that since we don't want to orient towards movement and now we'll see that we're strafing and we run forward we run backward and the blend space is choosing the correct running animation based on our yaw offset and that's because it's calculating the difference in rotation at least for the yaw between our aiming direction and the direction of our velocity so that's looking great now we don't have turning in place we just slide when we rotate left and right as we're standing still so no turning in place yet that will be in the next lecture that you can get if you join my patreon however i would like to be able to aim up and down so i would like to use an aim offset now this sparrow pack does have aim offsets so what I'm going to do is go back into my content drawer and go into Paragon Sparrow, Characters, Heroes, Sparrow, Animations, and in Aim Offset, 
we have AO idle. Now this is just like the blend space only it's for aiming. Now in the middle we see that we can aim up and down but we can actually aim all around if we wanted to implement looking left and right as well and that would be if we wanted to implement turning in place we would turn the upper half of the body and once it gets to like 90 degrees or 45 then we would play a turning in place animation and rotate we're just going to use the blend space for the pitch here so let's get this ao idle here and use it so we'll go back to abp archer and go back out to the anim graph and we'll go ahead and use our ao idle this ao idle aim offset so i'm going to drag it right in and for the base pose we're just going to use that ground locomotion and hook that up to output pose and use our pitch now we need a pitch and we can use our base aim rotation we'll grab that break that rotator and from this rotator we can simply get the pitch and plug that straight into pitch and now if we compile and save we can go into the level editor viewport and we'll see that we're aiming up and down now it's a little hard to see here so I can come back to my character blueprint and rotate the mesh by 90 degrees and hit play and now if I look up and down I can see that she is indeed changing her pitch she's using that aim offset just not for looking left and right but that's okay so I'm gonna go ahead and move that back to point forward okay so this is starting to look pretty good we can aim down we can aim up we still don't have jumping jumping looks a little funny so let's go ahead and fix that real quick so for our jumping I'm gonna make a new state machine and I'm gonna use the ground locomotion in that state machine so what I'm gonna do is bring that ground locomotion up and cache the pose so I can use it in another state machine so let's cache this pose and I'm simply gonna call this ground locomotion so we're gonna use that in a new state machine and right here I'm gonna create it so I'll type state machine add a new state machine and call this one locomotion so up here we have ground locomotion down here we have locomotion and I'm gonna use that now for the base pose so if we go into locomotion we can add some states here now I first want to add a new state for our regular locomotion that's basically just idle run so I'm gonna call this one idle slash run and open it up and use that ground locomotion so I'm going to use cached pose ground locomotion here and now I can come back out and the only thing that this is going to add is jump functionality so what I'd like to do here is add a new state up here called jump start and from jump start we're going to go up to the jump apex so we're going to have a new state called jump apex and from the jump apex we'll go to a jump pre-land so jump pre-land and from the jump pre-land we're going to go to jump land and I'll stick that over here so jump land now why so many states for jumping well there are different states to transition into if we take a look in the asset browser and search for jump we'll see that jump start looks like this so that's where our jump is going to start it's going to start off looking like that so we'll start with that here in the jump start state we'll add the jump start animation and after experimentation I've determined that the start position looks best if we set it at point two so we don't start at the beginning we start 20 percent into this jump start animation so that's our first state jump start now from jump start I'd like to automatically transition straight into jump apex and we have a jump apex animation and this is what it looks like now it's really fast and we're gonna slow it down because we might be in the air a bit longer than this so let's bring in jump apex here select it and here in details we're gonna go ahead and change the play rate down to 0.2 so once we go into jump apex we'll be playing that in-air animation quite slowly now from jump apex to jump pre-land we're gonna go into a jump landing animation we have this jump land we're gonna use that one and this one's gonna be quite slow as well we're gonna make sure to play this one nice and slow so that we can 
take care of the situation where we're in the air for a long time. So I'm going to set the play rate to this to 0.2 and this is what it looks like. It's basically letting those legs come back down. So jump land comes right after jump apex and we called that one jump pre-land because our jump land is going to be a little different. This one we're going to use an additive animation and we have the jump recovery additive here. So we're going to bring that in and this is an additive animation that looks like this. And the reason we're using an additive animation is because we may hit the ground and start running. So we're going to blend this animation with our running animation and it'll look more natural. So we're going to use a apply additive node. So apply additive is going to take a base pose and we'll simply use the ground locomotion. So we'll get that ground locomotion cached pose and use that as the base and our jump recovery additive will be added on top of that. So we'll start running as soon as we hit the ground but we'll still be playing this jump recovery. So she'll crouch while she's running and kind of come back up to normal. So we'll stick that right there. Okay, so how are we gonna connect these without having too many transition rules all crisscrossing and getting out of control? Well, Unreal Engine 5 has something new called a state alias. We're gonna add that, and I'm gonna call this to jumps. Now, a state alias lets us transition into a particular state or multiple. For example, we can transition into jump start or jump apex if certain conditions are met, for example, I want to jump if is falling is true, but I want to transition into jump apex if is falling is true. But what's the difference? Well, if we're actively jumping from the ground, I want to do jump start. But if we fall off of a ledge, we just walk off of it, I want to go straight to the jump apex, and that way we don't play that jump start animation if we fall off a ledge. So that's the simpler case. If we fall off a ledge, we'll go straight to jump apex, and that's going to be if is falling is true. So we'll put is falling in that one. And for jump start, we do want is falling to be true, but also I want my z velocity to be positive in the z direction. And that means I'm jumping up and not falling off of a ledge. So we'll get our velocity here and break it. So I'm going to break the velocity with a break vector and get that Z and see if it's greater than a certain value, say 100. If that's the case, then we know we're actively jumping up and not falling off of a ledge. So both of these should be true, so we're gonna use an AND Boolean. So we'll go ahead and hook that up. And now we have this weird two jumps alias thing. So when do we actually go into this two jumps? Well, in the details panel, we can decide what states can act as this two jumps alias. This alias will behave as an alias for any other states that we want. So if we choose idle run here and check that checkbox, then this is the same as having these two transition rules going from idle run to jump start and from idle run to jump apex. So this allows us to not have too many transitions here we can keep everything organized. Now we do need a way to get out of these states and back to idle run. So we can use an alias here. So I'm gonna right click, add state alias and call this to land and drag it straight to idle run. And the condition will be if we're not falling anymore. So we're gonna double click that, get is falling and use a not Boolean. So to land can act as an alias for one or more of our states. Now we want to transition to idle run from any of these if is falling is no longer true. So we're going to check all of these here except for idle run. So that basically means we have a transition rule from each one of these using not is falling. So this is great because now we can have different state clusters off to the side and the alias behaves as an alias for multiple states in our state machine. Now I did mention that I want jump start to go straight into jump apex, which means I need to take this transition rule and check automatic rule based on sequence player in state. That means when this animation is done, it'll go straight to jump apex. And when jump apex is done, we'll go straight into jump preland. So we can check that checkbox there as well. 
Now from jump preland to jump land, I'd like to do this if we're no longer in the air. So we're going to use is falling and get a not node. So we'll transition if we're no longer in the air. That means we'll go straight to jump land there. Okay, so let's compile this and see how this works with jumping. So I'm going to go ahead and jump and we'll see that we're jumping and landing and this is looking good. So we have our basic movement. Now it's time to start thinking about shooting arrows. So to make shooting a little bit easier, I'd like to use our crosshairs. So let's go into our archer folder and into blueprints and we'll make a widget blueprint for those crosshairs real quick. So let's go to user interface widget blueprint and it's going to ask for the parent class. I'm going to choose user widget and call this WBP underscore crosshairs. So let's open this up and I'll just add a canvas panel straight away and we'll simply put an image in here. Now the image I'm going to anchor to the center and set the alignment to 0.5.5 and position X and Y to zero and check size to content so I can zoom in and see that it's sized to the content which we're going to set here in the brush to our crosshairs. It's X underscore hair and there's our crosshairs texture. So that's it. We have our crosshairs widget. We can compile and save that and add it to the viewport. So we'll go back to our third person character and we'll do this in begin play. We'll simply drag off and use create widget and select our WBP crosshairs. And we need to add this to the viewport. So we'll add to viewport as well. So if we hit play, now we'll see the crosshairs right there in the center. Now that's the center of the screen and I'd like to have a bit of an offset so the character isn't in the middle and we can see what we're aiming at. So we're going to go to our character, select the camera boom and add a socket offset. I'm going to add 120 for the Y and 75 for the Z and now we'll see that our character is off to the side. And of course you can choose whatever values you want for those but I'm going to use those values. All right, so we're all set up and ready to get to what this video is really about, which is bow and arrow. We're going to launch some arrows. So that means we're going to need an arrow. Now, if we go into our Sparrow folder, Paragon Sparrow, and go to Effects, Particles, Sparrow, Abilities, Primary, Effects, I know these are quite nested, we're going to open this pproto ballistic hit world and we see this arrow here that means this particle system is using an arrow mesh we're going to get that mesh and right here the very right side for the hit section we're going to click mesh data and right here under mesh we see sm sparrow arrow let's click browse to asset and double click that and open it and here's that mesh for the arrow. Now it doesn't have any materials on it and I'd like to add some so let's click on the material here and I'm going to search for M Sparrow with an underscore M Sparrow arrow and that looks nice. So now we have a glowing arrow and that kind of matches with our character's mesh here because the arrow is glowing there and that's actually the same material that's used here on the mesh. Okay so now that we have this static mesh Let's go ahead and make an arrow that we can spawn. So let's go back to the Archer Blueprints folder, right click, make a new blueprint and choose actor. And we'll call this BP underscore arrow. So we'll have an arrow actor and we can add a static mesh for that arrow. So let's add a static mesh and call this arrow. Now I'm not gonna set it as the root because I want an offset from the root. And we'll see why in a second. Here's the static mesh. I'm going to search for SM Sparrow Arrow and choose that Sparrow Arrow. And I'm going to rotate it by 90 degrees so it's pointing forward. And this is why I don't want the arrow as the root because its pivot point is right there in the middle. I want this arrow positioned like this so that the tail of the arrow is at the center of the actor. And that way we can spawn the actor using that point. So now that we have an arrow, let's go about actually spawning this. But before we do that, I'm going to take the arrow and go into the collision section and select my collision presets here 
and choose no collision for collision presets as our arrow doesn't really need to collide with anything. So now that we have this arrow, let's spawn one in response to a button press. That means we're gonna need to go to edit and project settings and scroll down to input and we'll add an action mapping. So let's add this action mapping and we'll call this fire. And I'll click here and click again on this select the key value part here. And that will set this to the left mouse button. So now that we have a fire action mapping, we can go back to our character blueprint in the event graph and implement this. Now I'm gonna go off to the side here and right click and type fire. And here's our fire action event. Now, the first thing we need to do is actually spawn an arrow. So I'm gonna drag off of pressed and type spawn actor from class and choose our new BP arrow class. So search for BP arrow and choose that. And we do need a spawn transform. So we need to decide where to spawn this arrow. Now, I'm gonna to go to our mesh and browse to it here and open our sparrow. Now, if I scroll down, we'll see that we have bones for the bow and we have bow base and there are a couple of sockets on the bow base, but I'd like to add a new socket that we can use so we can position it correctly. So I'm gonna right click on bow base and add a socket and rename this socket to simply arrow underscore socket. And now we have this arrow socket. I'm gonna hit W to see that its X axis is pointing to the right, but I'm gonna go ahead and rotate it by 90 degrees so its X axis is pointing outward. We're gonna use this arrow socket for the transform that we're going to spawn our arrow at. So to get that arrow socket, we need our mesh. We're gonna grab that and drag off of the mesh and type get socket transform and get socket transform gives us a transform for a given socket. And if we go back to our skeletal mesh, we'll see that we call this arrow socket. I'm gonna copy that name and come back to the blueprint and paste it here for the socket name. And now we have a socket transform. And I'm gonna leave the transform space at world and plug that in here. Now we're spawning this arrow. We need to set our collision handling override and I'm gonna set this to try to adjust location but always spawn. That way, if there is a collision when we spawn, at least we'll still get the arrow, even if its location is adjusted. Now for the instigator, that's gonna be for if we want our arrow to cause damage. Now we're not gonna cover damage in this video, but if our arrow caused damage, we need to know who to give credit for that damage. And we use the instigator for that. So we can get a self reference, get a reference to self and hook that in. And later on when you are applying damage, if you expand this drop down, we'll see that there's an owner and the owner is also important if you need to know who owns this actor and we can set that to self as well. So not super important for this video as we're not gonna use the owner or instigator, but in the future, if you do need those, you would set them here. Okay, so we're gonna spawn an arrow actor. Let's hit play and left click and there's our arrow. Now I notice it's a little low. That's why I wanted to make my own socket so that I could raise it up as it's a little bit low. So let's go ahead and go back to the sparrow mesh and we'll move it up a bit. And here's a cool thing. If I undock this here and then I go back in the editor and hit play, then I can set the editor to the left and my mesh editor here to the right. And if I possess the character, I can hit F11 to go into game view and shift F1 to get my mouse cursor. And I can move the arrow socket up a little bit, come back over here and shoot an arrow and see what that looks like. I see that it's still a bit too low. So shift F1 to get my mouse cursor gonna drag that socket up a little more and shoot again and I can iterate back and forth this way until I get that arrow at the correct spot so I'm gonna make it just a tad higher and I'll go ahead and bring it out a bit and now I see that 
the arrow is spawning at the correct location. Great. So shift escape to get out of that and F11 to get out of game view. And I'm going to redock that. And I think I'm going to close some of these as I don't need all of these open anymore. And I'm finished with my sparrow skeletal mesh there. I'm finished with my animation blueprint for now. I'm just going to leave my character and arrow blueprints. Okay, great. So we are spawning arrows, but this is nowhere near complete. The arrows don't even move. So the next step is to launch the arrows. Now, in order to launch the arrows, the best way to do this is to use a projectile movement component. So let's add a component and search for projectile movement and select that. And we can take our projectile movement component and give it some velocity. So under projectile, we have initial speed and max speed. I'm going to set these both to 6500 and hit play. And now if I launch, then there goes my arrow. So we're one step closer to having a good working bow and arrow. We still have some issues. We're not playing any animations and it's just flying through everything, but we'll get there. The next thing I'd like to do is actually let those arrows stick into objects. And to do that, I'm going to select my arrow static mesh and add a box collision. So let's add a box collision component. And I'm going to drag this box up right here near the tip of the arrow. And I'm going to go ahead and scale it on down. So here is where I'd like the arrow to stick in to other objects. We're going to use an overlap event. So let's do that. Let's go to the event graph for our arrow now. And with our box selected, we're going to right click and use on component begin overlap. And as soon as this overlap event triggers, the first thing I'm going to do is get that other actor we overlapped with and make sure it's not equal to the arrow itself. So we're going to get a not equal node and use a reference to self and hook that up. If the arrow overlaps with itself, we don't really want to do anything. So I'm going to use a branch here and use that as our condition. And if we're not overlapping with the self, then we can continue. Now, the first thing I want is for the arrow to stop moving. So we need our projectile movement component to stop working. So let's get projectile movement and drag off of it. And we're going to use stop movement immediately. So let's see how this works. I'm going to go ahead and compile and hit play. Now, we don't get any results because we're not actually getting any overlap events. We need anything that we hit to generate overlap events. So I'm going to go into my map and select this wall right here. And in the details panel, if I search for the collision section, we see generate overlap events. If I check that and hit play, then I can shoot this and now we're getting overlap events. Now, we are still getting gravity on our arrows. So even though the projectile movement component is no longer making it fly forward, it's still falling. So to fix that, we can go back to our arrow and from our projectile movement component, we have a gravity scale. So we can search for projectile gravity scale and we'll set that and we're going to set this to zero. So we'll set projectile gravity scale to zero. Now let's see what this looks like. And now we see that the arrow sticks in to the wall. So this is great. We're one step closer. Now there is an issue with the way we did this, and I'm going to show you by enabling overlap events on these blocks here, which have physics enabled. So in collision, I'm going to check generate overlap events for these three blocks right here. And now if I hit play and I shoot these blocks, then we see that the arrows do stick into the blocks, which is great. But if I move the blocks, we'll see that the arrows aren't actually stuck to the blocks. So they did stop moving, which is great. But if we hit something else that's going to move later, well, the arrows aren't really stuck in. So that's not good. Let's go back to the arrow and see if we can fix that. And we can. What we can do is attach the arrow to the actor we hit. So let's drag off of projectile gravity scale and use attach actor to actor. Now this 
is going to attach the self. So we're, our target has self by default, and we're going to attach it to the other actor that our box overlapped with. So let's get our other actor and drag it straight into parent actor. That's the actor we're attaching to. Now, in order for this to look right, we need our location, rotation, and scale rules set correctly. We need to use keep world so that our arrow keeps its world location, but once it's attached, it will move along with the actor it's attached to. And weld simulated bodies means the physics bodies will weld together. So let's compile and hit play, and we'll shoot some of these blocks again. And if we shoot the blocks and we move them, we'll see that the arrows are now moving along with them. So that's great. So we can just riddle it with arrows and move it, and the arrows move with it. Now, as soon as we stop playing, we get a warning message. And it says that the BP arrow default scene root is already attached to something. And that means that the overlap event is firing off and trying to attach again. So once we've already attached to something, we don't want to attach again. In fact, we don't want any more overlap events after we've attached to something. So we can take our box here, drag off of it, and call set collision enabled. And this will allow us to set the collision for the box to no collision. So as soon as we go ahead and set that and press play, now if we attach and we have our arrows attached to something, we can go ahead and stop and we don't get any warnings. Perfect. Okay, so things are starting to look better. I'd like to spawn a particle system. So that's going to be pretty easy. We can simply drag off and use spawn emitter at location and use the location of our arrow, except I'd like to use the box location because the arrow is going to stick in right up to this point. I want to spawn the emitter right there. So for the location, we're going to get our box, drag off of that and get world location and hook that right in there. And now we need to choose a particle system. So let's go back and take a look at what we have. We have Paragon Sparrow Effects, Particles, Sparrow Abilities, Primary Effects. You can look at the other particles in here as well, but what I'm interested in is P Sparrow Hit Hero. Here's what it looks like, pretty cool. So I'm gonna select P Sparrow Hit Hero, drag it into BP Arrow, and drop it right here on the emitter template. And now if we press play and we hit some stuff, we're getting particles. So this is already starting to look a lot better. Excellent. Okay, so we are closer, but we're not quite there yet. For one, we're not playing any animations. That's still something we need to do. And for another, we have these crosshairs, but our arrow is off. <laughs> our aim is off. That doesn't look great. So we'd like to aim the arrow correctly. So a couple of issues to deal with here. So let's go back to third person character. And right here, here is our fire input action event. Now we're going to do things a little bit differently here. So let's go ahead and get our spawn actor node along with the associated nodes. We'll move that off to the side. And we're going to do several things here, which means we're going to want a sequence. So let's get a sequence here. And the first thing we should do is I'd like to perform a line trace. I'd like to take our crosshairs and get the world location of them. In other words, the camera location, the center of the camera. And I'd like to do a line trace straight out into the world. This is how we do this for shooter games. If we were shooting a gun, for example, we would do a line trace straight out into the world and see what we hit. So let's do a line trace. We're going to drag off of the then one and do a line trace by channel. And this needs a start location and an end location. Now, like I said, we want the camera location. So we're gonna right click, and to do this, we can get the player camera manager. And the player camera manager allows us to get our camera's location. So we can drag off and type 
get actor location and this will give us the location of our camera. Now to make things easier as we're going to be using a lot of these variables later on down the line here, I'm going to take this get actor location and right click and promote this to a variable and call this crosshair world location. So we're going to store that first thing. Okay. Now the next thing we need is the end location for our line trace. So I'm going to move the line trace over to the side. I'm going to get all these things, move them out of the way. And we need a vector, a location for the end of our trace. And I'd like that to be straight out into the world by say 15,000 units. So in order to do that, we need the forward vector for our camera. So straight off of get player camera manager, we're going to get actor forward vector. And what we can do is we can add this forward vector to get actor location. But before we do, I'm going to scale it. I'm going to go ahead and multiply this vector. And for X, Y, and Z, I'm going to multiply by 15,000 in the X, Y, and Z. So what this is doing is scaling the forward vector. Let's go ahead and comment this so we can keep this organized. We're going to say scale forward vector by 15,000. So when you multiply all three components of a vector like that, you're making the vector longer. And if we add this vector to the location, then the result is at the point of this vector. We're essentially taking this vector, sticking it at the tip of that vector, and then the result is the tip of this vector. So if you're not clear on vector math, I cover this extensively in my upcoming course, my Unreal Engine 5 Ultimate Game Developer course. So look out for that, it's coming out very soon. Now I'm going to take my actor location and add, so let's get an add node, we'll add this vector, and the result of this is going to be the impact target point for our line trace. That's going to be our end location for the line trace. So I'm going to promote this to a variable and I'm going to call this impact point. So now we have a start location that's crosshair world location. Let's comment this and say trace start location. And we have an end location called impact point. We'll comment this and say trace end location. And we'll use those for our line trace which we can stick down here because we have a sequence and we can keep things nice and orderly. So let's get these nodes. We'll move them out here and we'll use the then one from our sequence. And for the start, we'll use our crosshair world location. And for the end, we'll use impact point. Now line trace has actors to ignore which is an input of type array. It's an array of actor object references. I'd like this line trace to ignore our character itself. So let's get a reference to self and we can't just plug it in because this has to be an array. So we're gonna use make array. So we're essentially making an array with a single element. We're gonna pass that right in. Now to see if our line trace is working properly, we can choose draw debug type I'm going to draw for duration and expand the drop down and I see that my draw time is five seconds. So we should see a debug for our line trace. Let's see what that looks like. We'll compile and hit play and that's our line trace. And as you can see, it's exactly where our crosshairs are showing where we should hit. And if we hit the corner of a wall here, we'll see that the trace goes through the wall and it's green after that hit. So this is a color-coded way of showing us that we got a hit and the line trace continues past it like that. Okay, so now that we know that our line trace is working properly, let's continue. Now our line trace is going to hit something, maybe. And I say maybe because if I go up into the air, well, we're not gonna really hit anything up there. So we need to keep that in mind. We might hit something, we might not. So to find out, we take our hit result. That's this out hit. We're gonna drag off and break that hit result. And we see this Boolean called blocking hit. This will be true or false based on whether or not we hit something, right? And if we expand this, 
we have a lot of things in our hit result, including impact point, which is the location in space for the hit result. Those are the two things we're interested in. So the first thing I'd like to do is check to see if we actually hit something and do a branch. So let's do a branch here and blocking hit will be our condition. And the reason is because if we did hit something, I'd like to reuse my impact point vector. This is going to be used later on so that we can aim at the correct location. So we're gonna set impact point here and what we're going to set it to is the actual impact point from our trace hit result. But if we did not hit something, then we're just going to use the old value of impact point. Okay, so we have the impact point. Now we're also going to use some of these nodes up here. We have our mesh and we're getting the socket transform. Let's copy those nodes and paste them down here. And I'd like to take the return value from get socket transform and break this transform and that breaks it into a location rotation and scale and i'm interested in that location of our socket transform because this is going to be the location at which we spawn our arrow so i'd like to store that in a variable so i'm going to promote it to variable and call this arrow spawn location we're going to store that that's the next thing we're going to do right here and right here we use this branch to set our impact point if we got a hit. And if we didn't get a hit, we're gonna use its old value. Remember what its old value was. We set it up here. It was the trace end location before we did the line trace, right? So it's the point going out from the center of the camera straight outwards by 15,000 units. So if we didn't hit something, we're gonna use its old value. If we did hit something, we're updating it to our impact point from our line trace. So the false case here is gonna go straight over to setting the arrow spawn location, going around that update because we don't wanna set it if we didn't get a blocking hit. Let me just show you in 3D space, okay? Let's say that we shot an arrow from here and we're aiming this way. Well, if we hit this block, then our impact point is here. But if we're aiming up in the air and we don't get a blocking hit, well, we don't want to set impact point to this out hit result impact point because this will be meaningless. So if we set it to that, well, then essentially our impact point would be undefined. And we're going to use this impact point. We need to use the impact point so we can aim the arrow at the correct location. And that's what we're going to do next. We need a rotation to set for our arrow when we spawn it. And to do that, we're gonna get our impact point. So let's get that impact point here. And we're going to subtract the value of the starting location for the mesh. That's essentially this arrow spawn location. So let's get impact point minus arrow spawn location. This gives us the vector pointing from the arrow spawn location to the impact point. That's how vector subtraction works. It takes a target and a starting point and gives us a vector from the starting point to the target. So let's comment this and say vector from arrow spawn location to impact point. That's what this vector is. And we're going to use this vector for its rotation. We want a rotation corresponding to this direction of this vector. And we can do that by dragging off and using make rote, as in make rotator, from x. So we take the vector, we use make rote from x, we're familiar with this now. This gives us a rotator corresponding to this direction from the spawn location to the impact point. Now we're going to promote this one to a variable. So let's promote it to a variable and we're going to call this arrow spawn rotation. So now we have a rotation for our arrow and it's going to be pointed from the arrow spawn point to the impact point. And if we got a blocking hit, that's the point where our line trace hit. And if we didn't get a blocking hit, it's just gonna be the end of that vector from the camera straight out 15,000 units. All right, if you're still with me, let's continue. The next thing we need, now that we have our spawn rotation, is to actually spawn our arrow. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete that 
and keep my spawn actor BP arrow. We're going to drag it down, and this will be the third thing in our sequence. So we'll drag this down, and we'll spawn the arrow. And we need a transform. So I'm going to right-click, make transform, and hook that in. And for the location, we have the arrow spawn location that we just calculated. And for rotation, we have arrow spawn rotation. Now we can spawn the arrow pointing in the correct direction. Okay, excellent. Let's see how this looks. So let's hit play. And if we shoot an arrow, now we see that the arrows are going in the correct direction. Now the line trace debug is a little distracting. So I'm going to go back to my line trace by channel for draw debug type, we're going to set this to none and compile and save. And let's hit play. And we see now that our arrows are going in the correct direction. We're hitting what we're aiming at. Now, if I aim in the air, we'll see that we have some fall off. So if we're aiming at something super far away, we're going to see that we need to accommodate for that fall off. Now, if you don't like that, if you want your arrow to just go straight, well, you can just go to your BP arrow, select your projectile movement component, and set the projectile gravity scale to zero. And now your arrows will fly straight, and they will never fall. And if that's what you want, you can get that. But I like gravity for the arrows. I think it's more realistic. So I'm going to set that back to one. Okay, so this is starting to look good. Now, before we continue, I'd like my arrow to stick into everything. So I'm going to make sure everything has generate overlap events. I know those blocks do. I'm going to set this geometry here. In fact, I think I'm just going to go ahead and select everything here in the world. Make sure I have all of these selected. They're made of multiple parts, so I might miss a few, but that's okay. I'm going to make sure generate overlap events is checked. And now, no matter what I hit, I will always have my arrow sticking into it. Great. All right. So we now need a couple other things. We need our character to play a fire animation. That's one. And another is I can basically spam this like a machine gun. And that's not good. We're going to take care of those things next. First, let's do our animation montage. And that's going to be the next thing we do here in our sequence. We'll add a pin and we'll get our mesh, drag off, and we'll use play montage. Now, we could create a montage or we could use the montage in Paragon Sparrow. So if we go to Characters, Heroes, Sparrow Animations, and we search for Fire, we'll see that we have Primary Fire Medium Montage, and that's what it looks like right here. And we need to make sure that we're going to use a slot if we're going to play a montage. So if you want to play a montage, it needs to be assigned to a slot, and that slot needs to be used in the animation blueprint. Now this default group.upperbody that's the slot. It's basically a tag that says associate this montage with this tag called upper body. I'm going to click slot, go to slot name, and choose default slot. We're just going to assign default slot. Now when you do that, the montage will stop animating. And that's normal. It's not going to affect our gameplay. We're just going to go ahead and close out of that. And in order to use that slot, we have to go into our animation blueprint. So let's go to blueprints, ABP Archer, and we'll go to our anim graph. And just after locomotion, we're going to drag off and type slot and get that default slot. Now, if we wanted, we could change the slot name here and choose any one of the slots. There are so many because the Paragon Asset Pack has some, but we're using the default slot. That's all that matters. And now we can play montages. So let's play that montage. I'm going to stick that third execution wire from the sequence right into play montage. And we're going to select that primary fire medium montage. So if we compile this and hit play, now we're playing animations and this is looking better. 
All right, so we're getting closer. Now we can still spam it, however, so that's not good. So I'd like to make a Boolean that can prevent us from firing the animation. So here in BP third person character, let's add a Boolean and call this can fire. And we'll compile and set can fire to true right here in the details panel. So it's true by default, but as soon as we fire, we should check it. So let's add a branch. The first thing we do before the sequence, we're gonna add a branch and use can fire. And we'll only fire if can fire is true. And as soon as we've checked it, we're gonna set it to false. So we're gonna set this right here to false. And that way, as soon as we fire, we can't fire again. So I'm spamming the key and now I can't fire. So we do need to set it back to true. And I'd like to do that in the montage. So I'm gonna go down to play montage and browse to the asset and open that montage again. And we're gonna add an anim notify. In fact, we don't need to add one. There are a couple of anim notifies here. Now, if I add a new notify track, we'll see that these are the two notifies. Now, we're gonna use one of these. There's one called reset either comb or combo or something like that. We can go to our animation blueprint in the event graph. Let's go back to the event graph and we'll implement this anim notify. So we'll type reset and yes, it's called reset combo. So we'll use that. And in reset combo, we'd like to set that can fire Boolean. So we'll go back to the blueprint and here's can fire. What we need to do is set that to editable and compile that and then come back here and we're going to get our character and from the character we're going to search for can fire we're going to set can fire and we're going to set that back to true so as soon as we reach the end of that fire montage now we're setting can fire back to true and we can fire again so let's see how this looks so i'm spamming the left mouse button and i can only fire so much all right, it's looking better. Now, one more thing that I'm noticing, though, is as soon as I fire, we're sliding on the ground. We don't want that. We only want the upper half of the body playing that fire animation as the lower half should be still running. So we'll go back into our anim graph here. And what we need to do is for our slot, we need to use the slot for the upper half of the body and not use the slot for the lower half. And to do that, we can use layered blend per bone. So let's search for layered blend per bone. And we're gonna specify a bone to blend at. It's gonna be the middle of the character. And there's a bone right about here called spine zero one. So we can select that. So let's take our layered blend per bone with that selected. Under details, we have layer setup and index one, if we expand the dropdown, we see branch filters with zero array elements. Let's click plus and add an array element. And here we can specify a bone name. And it's gonna be lowercase spine underscore zero one. Go ahead and investigate on that skeletal mesh until you can find it. Now, layered blend per bone is going to have a base pose, that's for the lower body, and a blend pose, that's gonna be for the upper half. The upper half gets the slot because that's the one using the fire animation. And the lower half is gonna be simply locomotion without the slot, which means I'd like to cache this rather than just copying it. So let's cache locomotion. We'll use cached pose and call this locomotion. And we'll use the cached poses here. So right click locomotion and we'll use cache pose locomotion for the slot here. And this I can duplicate with control D and use it for the base pose as well and hook that right into the aim offset. And I'm gonna stick locomotion up here next to ground locomotion. All right, this is looking great. Let's compile and test this. So I'm gonna shoot and look at that. Now the legs are running properly, we can even jump, and everything is looking great. Awesome. All right, so we're almost done. 
One thing left though is that our arrows just linger. And if we have thousands of arrows, well, that's not good. We usually like to delete the arrows. We can destroy them after a set amount of time. And that's pretty easy. We can take our BP arrow, select self, and search for lifespan. And we can set the lifespan. So if we set this to say 10 seconds, then our arrows will be destroyed after 10 seconds. So we can shoot to our heart's content. Let's shoot all the arrows we can. And after 10 seconds, we're going to see them start to disappear. And there they go. Now, it doesn't have to be 10 seconds. It could be five minutes or something. So, you know, choose the value that you find is appropriate. 30 seconds is probably fine. All right, so the last thing before we wrap this up is if we go back to BP arrow and we select our projectile movement component, we have this rotation follows velocity. And I'm going to show you what this does. If we set our initial speed and max speed to a lower value like 200 and we launch some arrows, we'll see that the arrows do not actually follow the rotation of the velocity. And if we check rotation follows velocity, then when we fire an arrow, they actually rotate towards that direction of movement. I'm going to stick this up to 2000 to show this a bit better. So if I launch it, you'll see that they angle downward following the velocity. So that's something that you can set. So I'm going to set that back to 6500. All right, so that concludes this video. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe and comment below and tell me what you think, how you might have done things differently. There are always different ways to do this, but like and subscribe, that really, really does help. And there's a Discord link below. Go ahead and join the Discord. And I have a text channel where you can request future YouTube tutorials. And I'm continuing this series on my Patreon if you want to learn how to turn in place and use the rest of the aim offset, as well as some advanced animation techniques new to Unreal Engine 5, such as linked animation layers, then join my Patreon and you'll have access to that bonus content. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. I will see you next time.